Isaiah chapter 43. I keep doing that, don't I? Sorry. Hang on just a moment. There we go. Isaiah chapter 43. Um, and this is, as you know, Palm Sunday. This is the first day of uh, what we traditionally call Holy Week. And um, of course, it's the day uh, to commemorate the time when Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. Uh, but uh, I wanted to back up for just uh, a minute and think about the big picture. Because uh, what Palm Sunday is really about is this new exodus. Remember that uh, when Jesus was transfigured, uh, on that high mountain in the northern part of Israel, and uh, he was found to be talking with Elijah and with Moses, and uh, they shone, you know, brightly like, um, uh, you, know, you know, glistening white in all robes. And uh, um, the scripture says that the disciples that were with Jesus heard the three of them discussing Jesus' exodus. And that doesn't just mean um, that they were um, talking about the fact that he was going to exit this life uh, or exit this world. It has to do with the a whole new leading of massive people out of bondage and into freedom. That's really what Palm Sunday introduces. And the people who were there at the time, the ones that were stripping the trees and shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord, they knew that. That's what they were expecting. They were expecting Messiah. And they were expecting Messiah to come and to lead this glorious new exodus, um, a... a, a uh, a, a rebirth. Uh, they thought it was going to be just a rebirth of the nation of Israel, but it turned out to be a rebirth of everything. Uh, but they they recognized that, and that's why they were worshiping and praising. And uh, I, I've I've heard it so many times that, um, um, well, I'm sure you have too. That. You know, the same people I heard it this morning, people say the, the same crowd that that uh, praised Jesus a few days later was calling for him to be crucified. I, I don't see that in Scripture. I think the crowd that was praising him on Palm Sunday was predominantly a Galilean crowd. It was a whole group of people that followed Jesus from the northern part of Israel, from the region of Galilee. Gal Galilee. Uh, as he was, as Mark says, steadfastly determined to get to Jerusalem. And then now they're celebrating his coming, you know, and celebrating the beginning of this new exodus. I don't think they fully understood how that exodus was going to occur. I don't think they probably understood that it involved a cross. They certainly didn't understand that it involved a resurrection. But that's what they were rejoicing over. Uh, the crowd that's screaming for him to be crucified is predominantly a Judean crowd, a crowd from Jerusalem. Uh, uh, now, there, of course, there may have been some of the same people. You know, there's oh, whenever there's a crowd, there's some people that are just kind of there to see what's going on. But um, I, I, I don't think it's accurate, probably, to say that the same people that were uh, shouting Hosanna were the ones that later were shouting uh, crucify him. So uh, that's what really Isaiah 43 is about also. It's about this brand new exodus. Um, but before we get into 43, Isaiah 43, think for a moment about the grand narrative of Scripture. I'm talking about the, the major theme, the mega theme of the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. So it begins with a triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, creating everything that there is. And the motive behind creating everything is love. 
triune God existing in perfect love from all eternity past, creating the entire cosmos out of love. Um, you might want to check your mics and make sure they're muted so we don't get uh, distracted. There's at least one mic that's open. Anyway, um, so the triune God created everything out of love, uh, including human beings. The human beings he created in his image. And certainly a big part of what that means is that human beings are created with the capacity to love and to be loved. God is love. His motive in creating everything, birds and butterflies and bees and uh, earthworms and, and stars, his motive, his motive in creating everything is love. But And when he created humans, of course, his motive was love, but he created humans with a capacity to love themselves and to be love, to receive and to give love. But of course, you know, you don't have to get very far in the book of Genesis before things go awry. Uh, the people that God created begin to seek for life elsewhere. They're seeking for purpose outside of God. They're seeking the energy to live outside of God. And so, um, you know, we have the fall. The, the, very, uh, the book of Genesis very quickly advances to the place where it, it hones down on one individual. That's Abraham. And so we're, we're back somewhere around 2000 BC in the time of Abraham. So God calls Abraham, and from Abraham, he chooses one of his sons, Isaac, and he chooses one of Isaac's sons, Jacob, and the 12 sons of Jacob eventually multiply into 12 tribes, which eventually become the people of Israel. Why did God choose the nation of Israel? Because he wanted to reveal himself to the whole world. He wanted these people, this group of people, to be so familiar with him and to live so in tune with him that everyone else would see how glorious that is and be attracted to God. Um, you know the story. There was a famine in the land. Uh, they wind up down in Egypt where uh, one of the sons of Jacob, Joseph, is taking care of them. Fast forward, and now there are millions of Jews living in Egypt, and they are enslaved. They were enslaved for about 400 years. And then, of course, we come to the Exodus. The Exodus is about 500 years after the time of Abraham. These numbers are very, very rough, of course. Um, so we have the Exodus. Uh, and you know the story, you know, how God called Moses, spoke to him from the burning bush and uh, the miracles there in Egypt and the plagues and the Passover and then leading the people out of Egypt and, uh, and through the uh, parting the waters of the Red Sea and eventually, of course, uh, leading them into the promised land. So that glorious exodus. And that's what Passover is all about. It's about remembering that exodus. Now, fast forward another 500 years, another five centuries from the time of um, Moses, and now we're roughly in the time of David. And so under King David, the nation finally becomes a unified nation. Before it was just kind of uh, 12 um uh tribes that were that were um sort of kind of got along with each other but um they were very distinct now they're a unified nation but again the people choose to try to find life elsewhere that's what a idolatry is they're trying to find life elsewhere rather than in god and that goes on for the next 500 years or so until finally the nation is crushed by Babylon. And we've been reading about that in the book of Isaiah. And that occurred in 587 BC. The story, of course, doesn't stop there. 
the people are rescued and restored to the land somewhere around 515 BC. Um, and then fast forward another 500 years and Messiah comes on the scene. God in human flesh visits this earth, not just to pay us a visit, not to rebuke us, but to be one of us. So God comes in the person of Jesus, and yet the nation rejects God's Messiah. And as a result of that rejection, the nation is crushed by Rome. That occurred in 70 AD. But that's not the end, because Jesus, as we know, rose again from the dead, commissioned his disciples, and now he and 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 introduced the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a new Israel. It consists of Jews and Gentiles both who are gathered together with new hearts, filled with God's love, in communion with God, called to reveal God to everybody else. That was the purpose in calling Israel to start with. And how do we reveal God to everyone else? By imitating Jesus, by living our lives like Jesus. And of course, we can't do that on our own, but we're not on our own. God has given us the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit uh, to enable us to live like Jesus. And as we look to the future, we know that the glorious event that we are waiting for is when he comes again. And at that time, he's going to resurrect all of creation. Uh, our physical bodies are part of that, but all of creation is going to be resurrected. So Isaiah 43 begins with this creation out of love. Uh, verse 1, but now thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, that's another name for the uh, nation of Israel, he formed you, O Israel. God created us out of love and formed us into his image. Now, stop and think about that for just a moment. God is love, motivated by love. He created you with the capacity to love and to, to love others and to be loved by others. That means that God is a personal God. When you say uh, God is love, that implies personality. Uh, a, a, you know, a, a, um, a life force can't love you. Gravity doesn't love you. You know, it, it's there, and I'm glad it is there. Otherwise, we'd fly away. But, uh, it, the, the, you know, electricity, electromagnetic forces can't love you. So, other religions talk about a life force, or they talk about, um, you know, an impersonal God who is, who is someplace, you know, pervading the universe. That's not the God of Christianity. Our God, the, the, the God of Israel, the God of the Jews and the Christians, is a personal God. Yahweh is a personal God. And the picture that we have in throughout the Bible is of this perfect love existing as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that triune love overflowing to create. That means, bottom line, God absolutely adores you. Not only does he adore you, but he has grafted you into Israel. God's not finished with Israel. God didn't say, well, uh, okay, the Jews blew it, so we're going to set them aside, and now we'll get another group of people. I know. Let's make let's uh, let's replace them with Americans. No, God doesn't do that. <laughs> God's purpose is always fulfilled. Yes, a lot of the nation of Israel has rejected God and has over the over the years, but God is grafting us into. Israel. So the kingdom of God is made up of Jews and Gentiles both. Now one body in Christ. And God says to us, do not fear. I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. 
He has redeemed us. He's purchased us. He purchased ancient Israel out of Egypt. He purchased ancient Israel out of bondage with uh, to Babylon. He purchased us out of sin and slavery, and he's made us his children. When you pass through the waters, God says in verse 2, and what a beautiful memory verse this is, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. No matter where you go. Now, of course, in context, God is speaking to the nation of Israel, which at the time was in bondage to Babylon. And, and through Isaiah, God is predicting that he's going to set them free and that they're going to be allowed to go home. That's the immediate fulfillment of the, pro of the passage. But the long-range fulfillment applies to all of us who are grafted into Israel. And the same promises, the promises of God are yes and amen, the Apostle Paul said. All the promises of God are ours in Christ Jesus. So when God says to ancient Israel, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you, he's also saying the same thing to us. He's saying you're on a journey. And along that journey, you're going to have some trials. You're going to have some tribulations. There's going to be obstacles. There's going to be things like water. There's going to be things like fire, you know, uh, figuratively, at least speaking, that you're going to go through. But God says, I'm going to see you safely through those things. Life is a journey. It's not just about the destination. Now, I'm really grateful for the destination. The destination is to be with God forever. But uh, don't, don't um, uh, minimize the importance of what God is doing now. Your life today is part of that journey. You're on a journey with God. And a lot of times the journey is the point. Uh, so cherish the journey. Learn to appreciate each day that God gives you and each opportunity that God gives you. You know, some people are so uh, focused on the future um, that they miss what's going on right in front of them. Uh, others are so focused on the past that they miss what's going on right in front of them. Cherish the ongoing journey. Learn to live in the moment. For I am with you, verse 3 says, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. I give people in return for you, nations in exchange for your life. Now, that's a poetic uh, piece of hyperbole. God would never literally trade the lives of anybody for anybody else. God loves Egyptians and the Cushites and the Ethiopians and so forth just as much as he loves the Jews. Uh, so it, it, this is, this is um, a poetical way of saying that uh, God loves you so much that he's, he, would, he would give anything to rescue you. You know, you know, it's a poetic way of saying, I, I, I adore you. I love you so much that, that I'd do anything to win you back to myself. And he did, didn't he? <laughs> he went to the cross and he died for us so that we could be rescued, so that we could come into his presence. When we speak about the election of Israel, um, it brings up the question, why did God elect Israel? Why, you know, why not um, the Canaanites? Why not um, the Jebusites? Why not the Chinese, you know? Um, well, the answer to that really is not given in the scripture. We do know that God did not elect Israel because they're superior in any way or better than any other group of people. He, he picked a group of people, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because he had to pick some group in order to demonstrate his love and his grace to all people groups. But God doesn't love Israel more than he loves China. God loves 
every people group because God loves every single individual human being. Uh, and I, I just point that out because um, there, there are people around who see the, the see Christians as kind of a, a special group of elect people. God chose us and he didn't choose you, you know. Uh, that's the same pride that the Pharisees fell into. Uh, the church universal is not an in-group. Yes, God has chosen you. Yes, God has chosen us. Why has he chosen us? To love others and to serve others. N not because we're better than anybody, not because we're worth more than anybody else. Scripture goes on, do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offering from the east and from the west. I'll gather you. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from far away and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. In context, he's speaking about the Jews who are in captivity to Babylon, who have been transported away from their homelands and resettled in strange areas. And God is saying, I'm going to reach out and I'm calling you all back into your land. And, and of course, uh, under Ezra, Nehemiah, and Zerubbabel, they did repatriate the land. So that's, again, the, the immediate con context. But it also applies in a greater sense to the whole body of Christ. This is what God's saying to the world. Uh, all of you that I created for my glory, whom I formed and whom I made, I'm calling all of you from the east, north, south, west, no matter where you are, no matter what people group you belong to, no matter what the color of your skin or the language that you speak or your particular culture or your understandings or your socioeconomic status or anything else, I'm calling you to come to myself. I stretched out my arms on, of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of my saving embrace. He's calling us all to himself. In chapter 43, verses 8 through 13, we have kind of a trial scene. Uh, and what's on trial here, it's not who's on trial, it's what's on trial. The idols that the uh, Jews had been worshiping, those things that they had been trying to draw life from, apart from God, they're on trial. And God says, I, I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I'm the one who declared and saved and proclaimed, not some strange God among you. You're my witnesses, says the Lord, and I am God. Indeed, since that day I am he, there is no one who can deliver from my hand I work, and who can hinder it? That's a rhetorical question. The answer, of course, is no one. What God's pointing out is that he is the only true and living God. We are a monotheistic religion. <laughs> we believe in one God. We are not a religion that holds to monolatry. Monolatry is the belief that there are many gods, but there's one God who's bigger and stronger than all the rest. And a lot of the Jews in ancient Israel had fallen into monolatry. They saw God as the biggest, greatest, most powerful one, but there were all these other gods as well. And God here says, no, no, those are nothing. They, they, they're non-existent. There is no God besides me. There is no life apart from me. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus said. No one comes to the Father but by me. There is no God but the God of Israel, Yahweh. So if we know that, and we do, why do we keep trying to draw life from other things? Why do we keep trying to draw life from, you know, relationships or bank accounts or um uh, tribal identities, or whatever. Uh, 
the source of our life, the source of love, the source of grace is God. Uh, at, at the very heart of the universe, there's like a geyser, like a fountain that is exploding with perfect love and with joy and with peace and with forgiveness and grace and mercy. That, that fountain is God. And if you get close to God, you're going to be drenched with those things. If you stay away from God, you're not going to experience those things. So draw near to the true and the living God is what God is calling us to say. Now, verse 14 in chapter 43, I'm told by uh, people that know these things, I'm not one of them, but I'm told by uh, people that are scholars that it's um, the, the Hebrew here is very uncertain and it's hard to translate. Uh, but I think the point is very clear, regardless of the translation problems. The, the point is that Babylon, this mighty uh, empire that has ruled, you know, most of the known world for this period of time and held people in captivity and all, is going to collapse. It's going to fall. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and break down all the bars and the shouting of the Chaldeans. The Chaldean is another word for Babylonians. Uh, will be turned to lamentation. Mighty Babylon is going to collapse. So come out from among her and be separate, the Lord says. Now he refers them back to the exodus under Moses. He reminds them of the miracle that he worked a thousand years ago when their ancestors were in bondage in Egypt and how miraculously, miracle after miracle after miracle, you know, all, the, all those plagues, miracles, uh, the parting of the Red Sea, a powerful miracle, the closing in of the Red Sea on the enemy, Another powerful miracle, leading them through the wilderness, pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, miracle after miracle, water from the rock, you know, manna from heaven every day. He reminds them of that. I'm the Lord, your holy one, the creator of Israel, your king. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea. Yeah, remember? Remember how I made a way through the sea, how I parted the waters? I made a path in the mighty waters so that you could walk right across on dry ground? Who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior? They lie down, they cannot rise, they're extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do, do you remember, Israel? You, you've heard these stories. Every Passover, you celebrate this. How I took your ancestors through the 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 uh, through the Red Sea on on dry ground, and then I closed the sea in on all those chariots and horses and that whole army and all those warriors that were going to slaughter you. You remember how I did that? Well, keep that in mind, but do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? What God's saying there, again, using poetic figures, is you recall the ancient Exodus. When I worked, yes, you, your ancestors have passed this story down to you. Every Passover, you get together and you celebrate and you remember those things. But it isn't just about something that happened a long time ago in the past. I want you to know that I'm about to do a new thing. Now I'm going to do it. Do you realize that right now I'm stepping in to rescue you, to bring you out of the bondage of Babylon and back into your land? That's, again, the immediate context. But look at how it applies to us. Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. This is the Passover feast. This is the celebration of God delivering ancient Israel out of slavery uh, through the uh, leadership of Moses. 
Uh, and the whole scene is remembered and reenacted, as it were, around the Passover table. And after the meal, Jesus takes the Passover bread and he breaks it and says, this is my body broken for you. He takes one of the Passover cups, there are four of them, and he says, this is my blood shed for you. Remember what I did way back then, but now I'm doing a new thing. Now I'm setting you free. As we partake of communion, we look back, we remember the Exodus, and then we fast forward, uh, you know, some 1,500 years, and we remember that Jesus celebrated that Passover feast with the disciples and gave new meaning to the bread and the cup. Now, his body, his blood shed for us for the remission of sins. We look back as we partake of communion. We remember that his death on the cross was the time when he absorbed into himself all sin, all iniquity, all transgression, all the evil in the entire universe, including every sin that I've ever committed. He took within himself and paid the penalty shed his precious blood so that you and I would never be separated from God. As we partake of communion, we remember that. As we partake of communion, we, by faith, enter once again into connectedness with God. We draw near to that fount of blessing, which is at the center of, the, of all of reality. And we drink deeply from the well of living water, and we experience life abundant. And we also look to the future. And we know that God is doing a new thing, that he's gathering together Jews, Gentiles, men, women, people of all ethnicities and backgrounds and colors and shapes and sizes, and he's making us one in him. He's calling us out of our various nations, and now we are uh, citizens of the kingdom of God, living our lives today, hopefully in such a way that others will be attracted to Jesus. And we look to the future when we know that our Lord is going to come again and resurrect the whole cosmos, all things made new. Our bodies will be resurrected. Uh, the, the trees will be resurrected. The planets will be resurrected. Everything new in Jesus. This is our God. This is what Passover is all about. The original Passover was, of course, all about, you know, the deliverance out of Egypt. And so they had the sacrificial lamb, remember, each family had to choose a lamb uh, and then slaughter it, innocent animal being slain. They had to catch the blood in a basin and then paint it, as it were, over the doors of their houses. And then they would huddle together in the house and the angel of death passed over them. So it is with us. Our Passover lamb, Jesus, the lamb of God, died on the cross precisely at Passover so that death now passes over us. Our sins are forgiven. They are forgotten. The ancient Israelites crossed the Red Sea, leaving slavery behind. They headed out towards a new life. We enter into this kingdom of God symbolically through the waters of baptism into new life in Christ, citizens of God's kingdom, led not by Moses, but by King Jesus, following our King into the new creation. God is doing a new thing. Everyone's invited now, not just Jews. Jews are certainly invited but it isn't exclusive to Jews. All are invited. And when we respond to that invitation, our hearts are changed. The Holy Spirit is put within us. 
God writes his law on our hearts. In other words, he enables us, he gives us the power to do the things that Jesus said to do, to live like Jesus. That's what the word Christian means. The original followers of Jesus didn't call themselves Christians. The unbelievers gave them that label. Christian means little messiahs, little anointed ones, little Christs. What they saw when they looked at the original followers of Jesus were a bunch of people who were living like Jesus, who were turning the other cheek and going the second mile and washing feet and serving others and were willing to sacrifice their lives for others and who cared for the least of the of the people. A brand new thing. It's not an external law. It's a law of love that's written on our hearts. God is doing a new thing. We're delivered from sin. We are set free. Our enemies, and the biggest enemy we have is death, alienation from God. Our enemies have been destroyed. The old is buried. We have risen in newness of life. That's what baptism symbolizes. We bury the old, risen in new life. Mm, glory to God. And not only that, but God is going to redeem all of nature. He says, I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, jackals and ostriches, for I will give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. Why is God doing all this? Why does God even bother with us? Because God is love. Because God is motivated by infinite grace. Love was the motive of the exodus under Moses. Love is the motive of the new exodus under Christ. Mm -hmm. The chapter kind of ends on a sad note, basically God asking, what's it going to take for me to win your hearts? He says, yet you did not call upon me, O Jacob, but you have been weary of me, O Israel, and then skipping down, rather you have burdened me with your sins, you have wearied me with your iniquities. Here they'd been in exile for 70 years, and it still didn't produce repentance. It still didn't produce the kinds of insights that were needed in order to come back fully to God. God's calling us not to just go through some rituals, but to worship him, to love him, to adore him with all that we are, with our heart, with our soul, with our mind, with our strength, with everything that is within us. But please take note of verse 25. I alone am the one who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. Not because you earned it or you're really you got a lot of potential, but just because my heart's overflowing with love, I have blotted out your transgressions, and I will not remember your sins. The difference between sin and transgressions is that sins are accidental and transgressions are on purpose. Both are gone. They're off the table. They have been washed away. They have been dealt with by Jesus on the cross don't let anybody bring them up again. Your sins are forgiven. They have been forgotten by God. God says, I will not remember your sins. He has the ability to erase his own mind, as it were. He has taken all of our sins and cast them into the deepest sea. He separated our transgressions as far as the east is from the west. They are gone forever. It's accomplished on the cross. Oh, glory to God. It was uh, Karl Barth was uh, considered to be the greatest theologian of the 20th century. And he was uh, on a 
visit here to the United States and someone asked him, Dr. Bark, uh, when did you get saved? And he said, well, I think it was about 32 AD. <laughs> That's right on. You were saved when Jesus died on the cross for your sins. That's when you, not, not when you acknowledged it, not when you went forward at that service, or not when you said that prayer. You were saved the moment Jesus, because on that cross, he took upon himself all your sins and all your iniquities and all your transgressions, and they are gone. So some of the people were then saying, well, oh, that sounds wonderful, but and then why why did this why did this if if you're so loving and so kind why why did this captivity this exile why did it happen and god says well you want to accuse me well then let's go to trial set set forth your case maybe you can be proved right your first ancestors sinned and your mediators rebelled against me therefore i profane the princes of the sanctuary i delivered jacob to utter destruction and israel to reviling. In other words, the reason for the exile, that was the natural consequences of you turning your back on God. And that's what judgment is. You cut yourself off from the source of life, you're going to experience death. If you purposely stay out of the light, you're going to be living in darkness. If you're far away from the only source of forgiveness and peace, then you're not going to have forgiveness and peace. So, bringing it all together, remember that God takes care of our past, our present, and our future. With respect to our past, God created you, motivated by love. He redeemed you, motivated by love. He made you new. He forgave your sins. He washed you clean. He put his spirit within you. And he led you out of the bondage of sin and injustice. And we celebrate what God did in the past. But it isn't just past. It's now, too. It's in the present. Right now, you are in a state of forgiveness. You are beloved of God. You're on a journey with God. Rejoice in it. You've been grafted into the vine. You're part of Israel now. You're part of God's people. You've been grafted into Jesus, and his life flows through you. And also, God takes care of our future because all creation is going to be made new. So as we partake of communion, I invite you to think back to the past, the cross, when Jesus took away your sins, and I invite you to think about the present. You're invited to connect with the creator of the universe right now. And also think about the future. Jesus is making and will make all things new. Everything will be redeemed and resurrected. So I invite you to take the bread and remember that at that last Passover feast, when Jesus took the bread, he broke it and he distributed it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Father, may this bread become for us the body of Christ. Amen. And after the same manner, the scripture says, Jesus took the Passover cup. He lifted it up and blessed it. And then he passed it around to his disciples and said, Drink from this, each one of you, for this is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for the remission of your sins. Father, may this cup become for us the blood of Christ.
Oh, Lord, we thank you for your loving kindness, which is better than life. And Father God, we rejoice in your holy presence. We sit in your goodness. And we pray that you would inundate, inundate us with grace and mercy and love, not just so that we could feel good, but so that that grace and that love and that mercy and that kindness would overflow out of us and bless everyone around us, that others might see that you are the fount of blessing. And I ask it, Father, in the mighty and the precious name of Jesus. Amen.